Hello and welcome to ELT Under the Covers. Uh, today we have a new guest with us, but before we uh, go to talk with our guest, uh, we're going to have a few introductions. So I'm Neil of Team Teacher Fame, and I'm with my co-host. You're not going to do the thing? Okay. What, what's uh, the thing? Rich. Professor Rich. Well, normally you, you, you have an adjective beginning with R and you... Of say something rich beginning with R. Is that is that gone now? I, we I moved on. This is season we're, we're, two. We're, we're we moving on. It's season two now. <laughs> right. It's next level. Okay, <laughs> that's good. I, I I I greet that because I think to be honest, we were we were flogging a dead horse with that one. All right, uh, I'm Rich. Uh, YouTube.com slash Professor Rich weekly live streams. Check it out. And today we have uh, a 15 year teaching veteran, a titan in teacher mm. training and development, uh, task-based learning Lumiere, one half of Dublin TEFL, Emma Mead Flynn. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil and Rich. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's mm -hmm. a pleasure yes, to have you. Uh, mm -hmm. Totally our pleasure. So let's start off with the origin story. Yeah. Could you I take us all the way back? Story, yeah. Yeah, having now got a child who's into, you know, such things. <laughs> I'm a big fan, you know, of the, the origin story. So, yeah, I um, I think I have maybe some things in common with, um, with you guys, definitely. I, I started in Korea a long time ago. Um, and I know, Neil, you've worked in Korea as well, right? I have. Um, I love Korea. Yeah, I have to say, I went for the adventure. Mm -hmm. um, as I think a lot of people, you know, I'm an accidental Teffler. Um, I am here 15 years later um, because I finished my degree and I knew that I didn't want to stick around Dublin at the time, um, but I had no idea what to do. Um, I went to that like, you know, careers fair day thing and all the lovely, big, bright, shiny Price Waterhouse Cooper, if they even, uh, you know, the, all that, all that stuff. I, mean, I don't know if you guys, you know, can relate to I that. Like, I remember that. The university bet... thing and it was, sorry, Rich, there. No, I was just, yeah, I was just sorry, uh, reminiscing myself on those careers first. I remember like the two that I spoke to specifically was like someone offering a local journalism course, which actually ended up being the one that I took. And the other one I spoke to quite a lot was the prison service. Thank God I didn't go with them. The guy was really selling it, though, you know, he was just like, <laughs> oh, the benefits and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, now... 20 years later, benefits, you know what I mean? Anyway, that's a whole other mm. story, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, so I, 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 you know, those career days just sort of left me a little bit cold. And I think I only went to two, to be honest, um, probably under duress from my parents, I would imagine. Um, but I, I went to them and the one, the only stand that stood out for me was these like two, these two Irish women who had set up a company, sending people, sending people, it sounds very... Uh, Okay, because they were they had, you know, a kind of relationship with schools yeah. in Korea and, and all that kind of jazz. And um, and I was <laughs> at this particular careers fair with my very like minded uh, friends. It was three or four of us. And I think we all got the great idea at the same moment to sign up to it. Um, and yeah, like what, 15 years, more than 15 years later, maybe that's 18 years ago, 18 years later. Um, I'm the only one still in it. But like it was probably the best random sign I've ever seen in my life, you know, because it did start something kind of cool um, for me and certainly not something that I would have ever plotted out because really what I really wanted to do was go back to university. Um, I wasn't ready to leave. Um, you know, <laughs> I felt like I was being kicked out yeah. um, in a way. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's in. Like, yeah, you're finished now. Off you go. And in Ireland, um, I mean, this is kind of irrelevant, but sort of important for me was it was quite inexpensive to be a undergraduate student and mm -hmm. um, so I had quite a lovely life you know I don't, there, there aren't big fees to pay here or there weren't certainly at the time that I went to university mm -hmm. I worked I had like kind of a steady income great life I did uh, a double a double not master just a double degree just because I could make a decision between two subjects so I did English mm -hmm. and I did psychology I was learning loads enjoying everything and after four years, because I got four years to do my two <laughs> degrees, I was just like, no, I'm not ready to go. But to do a master's in Ireland, you do need a lot of cash. Yeah. And I mm. certainly hadn't saved any. So this Korea thing was like, so I can go and earn a load of money and, and then I can come back and go back to university. That sounds brilliant. Um, I'll do that uh, for a year. 
Um, and then a year turned into kind of almost 18 months in Korea. Um, you get that kind of year contract thing. I don't know if you had it yep. the same, Neil. And they kind yep. of ask you, do you want to extend? And about halfway through my first year, I I mean, the first year was it's really standard stuff. It's Hogwan. So Academy, Language Academy, it's you have kind of random classes, but a full timetable. You're teaching um, kindergarten, maybe in the morning, middle school, all the way till 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, you, you got to um, go, you go up with the ages, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, they, and they're there till 10. And, you know, it's this whole like cultural experience as well for me. It's just like eye opening completely. Um, and I, I loved that. I'd already traveled quite a bit. So I'm having a great time. And then I get offered six months into that kind of a bit more responsibility. And I do like a bit of responsibility. I like a bit of control, you know, yeah. I like a bit of, um, would you like to run the kindergarten thing in the morning? Um, pro perk is you don't have to do that late night teaching anymore brilliant um con is it starts at six in the morning <laughs> um but you have to you know you get a bit of control you get to design the, the kind of program and it just so happened that i'd been doing a bit of the kindergarten stuff and the young the very young learner stuff and i'd mm -hmm. been doing a lot of kind of what i didn't know at the time was project-based work basically with them i mean they're like they're tiny they're threes and fours. Oh, so they're you're doing like crafts and you know exactly, like coming up with yeah. little things and yeah yeah i, I don't know yeah, we're that's making, awesome that's what they need books. at that age exactly what they need exactly yeah and it was very different very kind of very revolutionary shall we call it now there was a lot of reasons why i was doing that um one of them being that i didn't have to do much prep because you know bit of card and paper so emma who gets up at six o'clock well five o'clock in the morning to go work at six o'clock i could just about kind of do that but then i sort of started to see the benefits of it and loads of these kids have like quite quite affluent backgrounds you know to be sending your kids to these um morning yeah. classes you know kindergarten it's essentially daycare that starts really early with english but um but anyway like quite a lot of behavioral issues i don't know if you experienced that too kind of from like certain a certain backgrounds yeah. would have some a couple in the class and suddenly this kind of project stuff was just like solving a whole lot of problems that i didn't know it would mm -hmm. um so yeah again another accidental i feel like i'm a very accidental um kind of career um I, I suddenly found myself working and becoming quite good at doing project stuff it was a long time later that i reflected on that as being that's what it's called i think we used to call it uh, crafting or something like that you know yeah um communication and crafting we sold it as or something like that um at the time and now people do that and i've gone to amazing webinars and um attended um in spain when i was based there people who do that like they, they train you how to do that. So I think there's there's definite value in it. Um, anyway, so got a bit of responsibility, hung around for a bit longer, stayed in Korea, but still, you know, kind of eye on the bank account to get back to university. Mm -hmm. The only problem was I couldn't figure out what I wanted to go back to. So it's like, do I want to go back and do like teaching? And that would always been like, but I'm not going to be a teacher. Yeah, I'm going to do English for my degree, but I'm not going to be a teacher. Yeah, I'm not going to, but that's just so like, so cliched i'm not going to do that um so anyway uh, here uh, i am what, what was um, the alternative was it author or writer some no, sort of yeah, writing oh, yeah yeah or... yeah obviously the secret the secret um plan was to be you know a um outstanding world uh renowned and very respected um, journalist in what field I'm not sure but some field of journalism like gastronomy <laughs> or travel or something yeah, yeah. and something like really you know like really impressively kind of like oh Emma's a wow that's really impressive um yeah so again no clear goal like so nothing really there and there was no course I wasn't coming back to do you know that course in that university and so that sort of was another factor that affected me hanging around in Korea, mm -hmm. getting a little bit of money. And then um, that great idea that I had when I was in university to go to Korea, um, I think is a long list of great ideas that I kind of aren't really my ideas in my career, but I see someone else do them and I know a good idea when I see them and I copy them. So the next great idea was that my best friend who had been living with me in Korea at the end of this 18 months was like, let's not stop this whole like travel teaching thing. Let's just keep it going but let's go like get some qualifications because we didn't have any. Um, so there's this thing called a CELTA. I'm going to do it in Hungary. And at this stage now, me and my best friend have fairly unhealthy relationship with each other because we've been in school together since we were about 11. 
and we've you know kind of tried to to like leave each other at several points to make independent decisions but we always find our way back to each other oh, no. <laughs> so we're in, we're, we're in korea and we're like yeah we'll go traveling we'll go home and then we'll like definitely do something different and yeah meanwhile like six months after coming home we're both uh self qualified i went to london yeah she stayed in dublin so i think you know we did diverge slightly she stayed on in dublin i went to london and again i did my celta course with big plans to go abroad again um, and at the end of my CELTA course, I got offered uh, a job in London. And my big plans to go abroad were a deposit back in the days when you could pay a deposit, a deposit yeah. on a airfare to Buenos Aires, I think. Oh. Maybe Santiago. Can't quite remember. I was definitely going. I was definitely going. I had my £70 paid. You, on had, my proof. Ticket. you had proof. You had proof in your deposit. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I had my ticket. Um, and then I get this like call into the office at the end of the CELTA course, which went well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, for me, having taught for like quite a while in Korea, it wasn't the most challenging thing I had to do. It was very difficult. To, how, um, how did you find it? Because, you know, the CELTA is aimed at adults um, and yeah. you, you were more focused on kids. How did you find yes. that? Yes. I found that I had done kind of a lot of private work with with basically kind of um, housewives in Korea. So I'd done a lot of conversation classes and I basically realized, yeah, that teaching was kind of like good teaching is like a really good conversation class where at the end they can all say they've learned a few things, you know, mm -hmm. um, which weren't exactly like the conversation classes I was running in Korea. But definitely on reflection, I could kind of say that's what I think maybe maybe a good, that's what communicative teaching means, maybe at that yeah. point in my career, you know, it was like, I could recognize, like, probably it wasn't the turn the page with the middle schoolers and focus on a sound and then do a dialogue and then play a game where you throw a piece of wet paper at the board. Like that probably wasn't, yeah. you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> like I could, I, I don't could know. I, I, I distinctly remember wet paper being thrown in my salter. <laughs> Yeah, really. Hey, actually, having said that, I went on. To I'm joking. Work, so my my Celta teacher probably just give me a slap. She's going to come in. Yeah, coming but over I did. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, anyway, so there. Uh, sorry, I'm. I'm definitely, you know, digressing. But I'm. I'm on this. I'm finished the Celta course, and I get this offer, this job, and it's not really in line with these big, you know, Santiago, Buenos Aires. Emma goes to Latin America and does what I don't know, but obviously has an amazing time. Um, <laughs> that it's not really like in line with that however um i do have some friends in london who i had kind of been staying with and i quite liked their life you know they were kind of temping and doing other stuff and like tefling and temping are not a million miles away from each other you know mm -hmm. so i i hung on and yeah that was 10 years wow. 10 years that went on for in that time i happened to find myself in this school that i got this job offer in you know, where I did my CELTA, it was just a, one of those schools where you do your CELTA, you start teaching, you know, you kind of prove, you know, you prove that you're in it, which I happened to be in it. I really loved it. It turned out, you know, I was kind of good at it. It wasn't a massive strain on my life and I still got to enjoy myself. And then like two years later, you're kind of training, you're doing a bit of teacher training for, I wasn't Delta qualified yet, but you're doing kind of a bit of teacher training for teachers who maybe are looking to do like a one week course in the summer and then from there you go on I did my delta from my delta I went on to become a CELTA trainer CELTA trainer a couple of years later I'm working more in different kind of training like I'm designing training courses and then yeah like a couple of years after that I'm a delta trainer so it's like that's the kind of school I was in you know what I mean it's just like super development super um, opportunity 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 and yeah uh, 10 years later I'm like okay maybe London is done, you know, maybe that's... <laughs> so maybe you, spent ten, you spent 10 years in London? In London, yeah. Um, was years, that teaching teaching adults or teaching yeah, kids so or a range? Yeah, so I was doing the whole, the whole shebang, really, because we had that cycle where, you know, it's like general English, exams, mm -hmm. business classes, um, that's how your timetable was built. And then you'd have regular influxes of kind of closed groups. So I would yeah. teach Japanese. A Japanese group twice a year would come. I would teach them. Um, some uh, Spanish kids would come. I would teach them. And we had a, a couple of groups of Taiwanese um, kids. Mm. I'm talking about like teens as well. Um, come teach them. So I got this kind of interesting, really mixed experience um, as a teacher. 
um, yeah, of, of teaching quite a range of things. Just like really, really lucky, I suppose, as well as a trainer, because it really informed me as a trainer to help teachers now, especially. I can reflect back on that in spite of having, having lived somewhere like London, which is might not present a lot of opportunities. I can look back and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've taught like a closed group of monolingual teens. You know, I've done that. Mm. I remember what that's like. And I did that for a month every every summer. Um, so that's that was kind of London. But I think by the end of it, things had started to move online in the world because mm-hmm. that was now seven years ago. I know we might not be able to kind of reflect on that very everyone thinks it all happened last year, you know, but about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, things started to move online. Things like the CELTA course started to move online. And I started to work Mm. on those kind of things, especially because I Mm. decided to leave London, but I wasn't Mm. sure where I was going. So I, I, that was more or less when you started professor rich, right? Um, it was about then, wasn't it? I think it was was about nine, nine years ago when I started. Yeah. 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 I saw. I that's that's my that's my YouTube channel that was probably more successful then than it is now. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. a it's like a graveyard now. But um, back then, I think I was an yeah. I was an early ad- adapter and it adopter and it went yeah. quite well for me. Yeah. And now you've that... got English with Lucy and all those lot right, and they've yeah. kind of conquered YouTube. Yeah, but it was that kind of time, you know. I think we're talking mm-hmm. about the same kind of period, and yeah. I, I don't know like what happened first, whether I got this bug to travel or. I got offered the opportunities to travel, but something happened and I, I found myself in Saudi, back in Dublin, in Spain, okay. doing bits and pieces, like a month's course here. And I was designing for online work more. And I suddenly was like, mm. yeah, this is this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And then I made the, the jump to move to Spain permanently, kind of after a year of doing that, kind of around the world, so to speak, but mostly actually online, but, you know, helping people in a lot of remote places. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, moved to Spain and kind of, focused solely really on working with teachers at that point and that's when Mm. when I moved to Spain that's when I kind of I still teach as much as I can but as much as I can teach now is like not very much you know a couple of private students Mm. um yeah so I'm very much more in the yeah I find that an interesting thing actually kind of keeping it keeping a foot in the in the door kind of thing or something like that keeping a a dog in the game um <laughs> because i think some people like to do it and some people don't mm. right because you definitely get people who kind of once they move into teacher training or materials like that's the end of teaching for them you mm. know but yeah. you get other people who definitely keep keep their foot in the door i mean i yeah. I, I think I, I i imagine that i'll i'll always do the occasional bit of teaching mm-hmm. and um the the company that i work with a lot at the moment the guy who runs that company and they do all kinds of stuff. They've got a huge successful YouTube channel. They've got online classes. They've got this fancy website. Like they're a very good, like well-established online company. And he still teaches. He still teaches, uh, you know, not a great deal, but you, you know, you can book him on, on his own website, mm-hmm. like five or six hours a week. And I just mm-hmm. think with all of that other stuff he's doing, you know, um, I think the, the motivation for that must be similar to your motivations. You know, it's yeah. kind of just keeping your, I yeah. imagine it's something about sort of keeping your mind in the, in Definitely. the game or something. Yeah, I would feel really inauthentic personally, just personally, I would feel really inauthentic trying to help teachers do things if I wasn't doing things. And um, I think that's, it's not any, any trainer's fault, so to speak, that that happens. But I know a lot of people who kind of, because of their timetables and the institutions they work for, um that's where they find themselves they find themselves doing back-to-back training mm. and just like not really connected to the classroom as a practitioner mm. as an observer they're in the classroom a lot but that's a very different thing mm. um and i think it's where training can be improved as, as in a profession mm. we can we can be better at helping teachers by putting ourselves into their shoes no um mm. because that's where things get a bit disconnected you know when i deliver yeah. like my training course that I've designed and but I have no idea like what people are doing right you know the the, the teaching the day-to-day what's that involved what that mm. involves and I can't say that I, I know the day-to-day as much but I well I mean I have a couple of less I have a couple of classes with learners yeah. and I do teach we teach a, a group on our on our um on our dip and I teach them I teach them as much as I can I teach them every probably four weeks I teach them um, for a couple of hours so it's, it's a one mm. class a week sorry it's, it's a it's a very long course that the, yeah. the the teaching practice goes one day a week but I you know I, whenever a slot comes free I'll, I'll throw my hand in the ring to teach it I'm mm. like I'll teach it I'd like to teach that <laughs> so, but yeah um, 
That's kind of good as well. I guess it kind of <clears throat> means that they sort of get to know you. So when you're sort of sitting in the corner taking notes and stuff, then it's a little bit less awkward, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. I think you have to put yourself under the microscope as a, as a trainer and mm. as someone who wants to help teachers. Yeah, I, I totally, to I totally agree with that. And I, I actually, I, I think, yeah, it should, that is something that, that should be done a little bit more. Because I remember, <clears throat> I remember years ago, someone kind of, raving a bit about um how they'd seen and i don't know when or where this happened and we didn't actually ask jamie about this but that they'd seen like jamie keddy basically taught a class at like a conference and he just literally had the class and then all these teachers sat around the outside and they said you know it was sort of warts and all and i think a lot of people kind of you know felt that that was quite a respectable thing to do because no one's going to expect you to then give a perfect class in, in front mm -hmm. of all these kind of experienced you know yeah. fancy uh, fancy teachers and whatnot mm -hmm. um I think yeah, that might I think, have I I I might have there might have been innovate innovate ELT they did that right. a lot I saw I've okay. seen a couple of yeah Kerry Jones I saw do that and I remember that was quite formative for me seeing someone like Kerry Jones um who's just yeah someone I really look up to and have learned a lot from just the teaching in front of me it's like wow this is this is the stuff you know <laughs> um, for me you know that was and I think that's important to have that mm. as a as a trainer as well that there's people that I want to see teach or um, want to see, I mean, the ideal for me would be that I get to see people train, but that's a very closed door experience. But, um, mm. but certainly we can share as a, as a community, um, trainers, yeah. we can share our practices more and people yeah. are sharing their practices more, you know, to help each other develop. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess it, it, I mean, it's, a, it's probably a bit of a can of worms that, isn't it? Cause then you've got all of this certification, you know, with Trinity and whatnot. And we were talking a bit about this with John Kay, you know, and he was saying how he used to have extensive arguments with the um, like invigilators about, um, you know, the invigilator would say, oh, but, you know, they didn't have a, a language point, you know, and he'd say, you know, did you not watch the lesson? <laughs> like, yeah. um, and kind of have this sort of argument about, you know, sort of the, yeah. the box ticking versus the reality yeah. kind of thing. But, um, no. but he said as, he, as he's got older, he's learned to kind of just step back and just oh, no. nod his head and say, yeah, OK. <laughs> I know it's the real it's the real dark side I think of 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 training is is assessment and criteria meeting and um yeah I'm definitely when I say guilty or I'm definitely on that in that boat of like yeah when the assessor's there when the examiner's there we'll do what we need to do but the training yeah. you've received from from me from the organization from the course that yeah. is like not it's a, it's a it's a bigger thing than just that what you what, what i'm showing the assessor but i will help you make that assessor be very happy does that make sense but i'm not only yeah. going to help you make that assessor be very happy i'm yeah. also going to help you as a whole teacher yeah i think that's the, probably the right attitude yeah i, I would yeah. say so i it's mean the thing the things that whether i got from the out of the dip um were definitely the the kind of opportunity to do new things you know mm -hmm. and um you know the easy option is to play it safe but um, I certainly felt when I took it with with Oxford TEFL, like that I was encouraged to try different things and new things. Definitely, um, yeah. and that was brilliant. And I think that's what it should be all be, should all be about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tricky with the qualifications. Yeah, you you. It's just kind of a an institutional thing with education where you just generally is not even teach training, but when you're teaching as well, there's you could just lead into teaching to the test and you know that's what you kind of see a lot in the public school system it's mm -hmm. you know and that's what a lot of teachers complain about there is you know uh they're not they don't feel like they're teaching they're just teaching to help the kids you know get their gcse's or you know whatever is mm -hmm. the standard in in that particular country but you know it, does it help anyone mm -hmm. <sighs> it's, it's it's such a tight rope because we, is, we, we, we want to make sure that, you know, the kids or the learners are actually learning. So, you know, we can mm -hmm. change or, you know, improve upon the teaching. But also mm -hmm. at the same time, it's, you know, taking away a lot of agency from the teachers. And yeah. It's hugely important because if we don't have uh, agency as teachers, then we don't get these unique approaches 
like like yeah. the the Jamies and the 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 John Kays yeah. with the poetry and you know uh, yeah. like yourself you were kind of given it a lot of agency and career with the the kindergarten and I know it kind of started out yeah. as I'm just trying to make it easy for myself in a way yeah, but yeah, then yeah, yeah. it just yeah. it, that's that's what that's what kind of worked and then you've 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 built upon that so you know yeah. it's a, it's a learning process and it's just unfortunately there's no way to kind of assess if this teacher's heart is in the right place it's yeah, it's just if their I, learners are progressing and I think I it, a lot of it comes down to that if the teacher is just kind of trying to move, push the boat forward uh, or yeah. are they actually invested I know this whole empowerment of teachers I think it's a I mean I, I don't want to be too cynical about why we don't empower teachers but I do think there's sort of compounded issues around trust in teachers especially in TEFL teachers and as a profession I mean all of this stuff is kind of connected together so this is a little bit of my my kind of brain vomit now you might call it guys but <laughs> it's like if we trusted teachers a bit more some of those things might happen better like we would you know have teachers who are more willing to experiment and if we gave them more power and and control but the reason we don't is because as an industry, the TEFL, you know, the English teachers of this world, we have a really bad rep, you know, the, the, the profession has a bad rep and yeah. we don't help, not not we, us three, but the profession. And you know, there's a lot of loads of forces you might talk about that kind of control us, but some of the market forces are really ugly, you know, and they, they mm. kind of keep us in a place of disempowerment. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, this is like, I'm, I'm getting off my socialist, uh, you know. <laughs> um, no, but it's, it's kind of true. But you know, it? yeah, there's, there's sort of this stuff going on there that we could, yeah, if we could only, not only if, if we can, because if only sounds like we can't, but I think we can help teachers, small steps, like you say, Neil, mm. like just let them do a bit more experimentation with things like um, video telling, storytelling, poetry. Um, but there, there's definite fear, I think, of destabilizing what that might do to, mm. to the yeah profession. because the, the, there's I, I do see the other side as well because I, I realized that I was uh, as you coined it an accidental Tefla and I just happened to have a uh, an innate I need to do well at a job <laughs> just for my mm -hmm. own sanity um, yeah. but not not everyone not everyone has that so you might have an accidental tefla that's just well i can get a buy on my charisma in as often people talked about in china being a, a dancing monkey which obviously mm. doesn't help learners so there's kind of like smoke where there's fire and yeah so i understand why there's uh, there can be a push to standardize or even a push by schools to follow the curriculum because then they yeah. know that the students are learning, but uh, mm -hmm. it's yeah. I don't know how you how you kind of resolve that. To be honest, um, that's kind of one of the things that yeah. we're exploring with the. You know, I've always covers. I've always thought that like, and I thought this years ago as well. I've always thought that like, um, and it probably wouldn't it probably wouldn't even fix the problem. But I, I used to think that some sort of trip advisor for language schools might be helpful. But now thinking about it, then you've still got the idea of because um, it is possible to you know we know especially as experienced teachers, it's possible to pull the wall over the students' eyes. Mm -hmm. You can definitely make students think they're having good language classes mm -hmm. when they're not, right? And you know it's like you say, Neil. You know the, you get the colours, the fireworks, the flashy this, that, and the other, and you get you get students coming up just saying, "Oh, he's such a good teacher. Oh, I really love blah blah blah." And you kind of know who they're talking about, and you maybe you've listened to their lessons, right? And it's kind of like them kind of monologue entertaining the students for 60 minutes you know and you kind of think hmm are they a good teacher or do they just like them as a person you know that kind of thing yeah. uh, so then they even if we had a trip advisor for language schools then it might be a case that you'd get the kind of um you know the, the whatever the walmarts or the the the, the mcdonald's getting the high ratings you know um, <laughs> or whatever yeah so what we really need is like a michelin michelin guide yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> We could call it yeah. the Richling Guide, and you can you can write it with Emma. <laughs> Terrible pun. I can't help it. Sorry. <laughs> we, need, we need someone like Scott Thornbury or something to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, 
you were in Spain, in Barcelona, and uh, everything was going well. And mm-hmm. and and now now where are we at now? Now we're a little bit forward from that. So we were we were there for a while, and things were good. And then this thing called COVID happened. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, what it's is pretty that? COVID? <laughs> like a type of bird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think loads of things happened. We we were we were thinking about where we, you know, that whole, I don't know if you do that, like I do five year blocks in my life. So yeah. we've been kind of thinking about the next five years anyway. But anyway, something called COVID came along and pushed us along a little bit. Um, and yeah, the, the, we were freelancing. So I'm saying we, sorry, my, my husband and I, we, we kind of work as a bit of a unit especially being parents in in the whole mm. TEFL industry I think sometimes um yeah like if, if he wasn't in TEFL I think I definitely wouldn't be able to do as much so we were there and and uh everything kind of fell from underneath us in terms of uh what the next five years were because the next five years we're going to be working remotely with a school in Barcelona um where we'd kind of I suppose if you like put all our our, our chips in because we were freelance for a really long time and I think being freelance is brilliant and I loved it so much um, and then we threw all our chips in um, and then yeah the school collapsed so we were <laughs> chipless you might say mm. um, um, yeah and so uh, needs must etc plus something that I've always wanted to do is become a kind of uh, my own I mean as I, I go back to the career story um, you know be a bit more in control of things myself I do like it mm-hmm. um so we, we we started a business yeah. um and I think for us this whole online thing that everyone else felt forced into um well not felt forced into what was forced into um for us it's something that we've been doing for a long time mm-hmm. and something we see massive value in and, and we're massive like kind of proponents of an online mode for people who want to work in the online mode, not as an emergency stopgap, you know, we don't see it like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this allowed us, I suppose, because everybody was going online, I think more people were discovering it. It's like the secret, you know, that you didn't know existed, but was out there. And it's that whole thing. It's like some people jumped online and were like, this is fab. I love it. Um, and those people want to keep working online. So what we've done is we've basically, yeah, set up an online school um, to help develop teachers who who do want to work sustainably in an online mode um that's not to say we're not helping face-to-face kind of teachers as well we are um but we're kind of interested in in supporting teachers who 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 want to do this thing this online thing properly so to speak you know uh, and what's what's the name of this school and how ah, so how can called... they get in touch <laughs> yeah so the school's called dublin Tafel. Um, and the website is www.dublintefl.com. And we were kind of impressed that it wasn't already gone as a name when we when we popped it in the search. Um, so yeah, that's that's us. And we are mainly at the moment providing dip T cell courses. So mm-hmm. that's something that um, mm. but yeah, Sean and I have lots of experience from our freelance days um, mm. being dipped tutors. Rich knows a little bit more about that. Mm. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, inter- it's interesting. Um, so because you you've sort of started this business, you know, like you say, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, obviously, the online element's a big thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, but uh, you know, have you have you found there's been a lot of custom? Because yeah. um, you know, I I actually feel a little bit detached from the the mm. sort of. Um, the, you know the te- the teachers at the ground level at the moment because I'm not seeing them I'm not going into a school yeah. you know um, yeah. so the people I'm talking to are just kind of colleagues from the past who are you know now sort of teacher trainers and all that kind of stuff yeah. so I don't really know what's going on at that level at the moment yeah I mean we're working with we're not working with closed groups so we're working with teachers who are working in really different I mean, I say context you know we have like exam teachers um, pre- predominantly in exam teachers we have some teachers who are working for example in like on platforms working with China a lot. We have mm. teachers who are working in in countries like Spain and Italy in that like hybrid mode, which is really common now, you know, where you've like half your learners online and half your yeah. learners in the classroom. Yeah, John Kay mentioned that. He, he said um, that um, a lot of the students who'd come in person 
had made comments suggesting that they weren't too keen on it and that they wanted to know if they came back again that they'd get um that they wouldn't be involved in a hybrid class that's just a, a side comment yeah yeah the hybrid thing is well i mean the first word that springs to mind is just well weird for me because like it's a whole just like also the word hybrid i find quite an unusual word it's just like a kind of curious word now it's kind of a curious thing hybrid what's what is yeah. this and um but this idea of like half 50 50 50 um is is so challenging for teachers it's incredibly yeah. challenging i'm working with yeah. teachers at the moment who are doing their projects you know on the dip um and they're trying to work with things like agency and engagement and autonomy in the hybrid classroom and it's like yeah that's, that's some hard stuff to be dealing with you know yeah. where and, and and one of my teachers you know i've seen her in her full get up like it's like some kind of i don't know uh, telly sales proper you know you know like full headgear like working the audience working the right. uh, the screen <laughs> Like, it's really impressive, but wow. it's a whole lot of skills. You talk about yeah. new skills, like that is a whole yeah. lot of skills that um, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't be stepping into that situation. Is it is it possible to do the the, the dip and have a pure purely online class? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that is possible. Okay. It is, yeah, it's Interesting. possible. Yeah, they've opened up a lot more. They opened up a lot quick, more quickly than Cambridge even, Trinity did. Um, I think, right. and the Cambridge are coming around to it, but... I think yeah. Trinity are, are really forward thinking. And that's what, for me, that's what it's all about, choosing to run a dip. Because we did have yeah. a choice. You know, do we go with Delta or dip? Yeah. Being, I, I'm a Delta tutor as well and have been yeah. for a long time. Uh, one thing I just, I love the dip for how forward thinking it is, forward yeah. facing for teachers. You know, it's all yeah. about where you want to be, where you want to go, how you want to use what you're doing to yeah. help you and in that's, your That's in your why career. I took it at the time as well. Everyone was talking about that. You know, when when I when I when I decided to go for the dip, they were mm -hmm. all saying, "Oh yeah, go for the dip. The dip's the dip's the one that's got a bit more focus on this, that, and the other." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, the question was about being connected to teachers. I mean, I feel very connected to teaching through the teachers that I'm working with, who are just working in like really different contexts, and most of them online or hybrid, as I say. But it's 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 a hard world out there, you know, online at the moment. It's a really tough, really tough world. Well, oh, yeah. that, that, that it's kind of meant that these worlds have converged because mm -hmm. before it was very, there are online teachers and there are local, mm -hmm. you know, in the country teachers. And often yeah. what you have is that off the, the local in-country teachers are either going to be, you know, those accidental Teflers that are traveling around the backpack teachers or very qualified, very experienced teachers in esteemed schools uh, mm -hmm. uh, and such. And then you've got online teachers that often, you know, could be like YouTubers that are just uh, not even doing mm. classes, but are just teaching mm. English but, you know, we still kind of consider them teachers. And then we have those that are doing online uh, classes. Normally, they're through a platform, uh, in my experience, uh, like uh, VIP Kids or uh, Magic mm -hmm. Ears, you know, yeah. the, like these yeah. China-based yeah. ones or even ones Rails, in Korea yeah. where, yeah, all, mm -hmm. all of these. And, you know, they're often very, they're not, they're they're not teachers. They're, very... they're just, you know, people that are doing it as their, like, they're like uber teachers yeah. kind of in well, they, a way they, they, exactly. but then, they're, but they're then the now ones. now all those local ones are coming into the online space and they're competing with yeah. the online ones yeah, yeah we're all teachers that yeah how but there's yeah. what what is the crossover what's the conversation how yeah. how does it all yeah, fit I... <clears throat> I completely went through that um, as I, I, I was looking for academic management jobs uh, at the time. And then when the pandemic hit and I, I even went for a few interviews and was like, oh, let's see, you know, and then suddenly it's like everything closed down. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I heard back from those interviews. It's like, we're not hiring, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> <That's> surprising. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we'll get back to you when this is all over in a couple of weeks or whatever. Um, so then, so then I kind of started fishing around online, and the first places that I come up against were those big, the big platforms, and that really is the kind of TripAdvisor 
style teaching, isn't it? It's who can sell it to the students best. And they're the ones who are charging like 60 quid an hour or more. Um, and you don't know, really know what qualifications they have, but mm -hmm. they've got loads of good ratings. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the bottom of the pile, you've got the people charging just ridiculously small amounts of mm -hmm. money, you know, like, um, you know, almost kind of less than minimum wage, really. Yep. Um, and I, I went I went through the, the kind of hiring process for one of those companies because mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'm going to have to go online. And I, I, you know, I put loads of things out at once. Uh, and one of the things I went through was the process of them. And it was quite interesting. They had this Zoom call. I can't remember the name of the company and I don't particularly want to say it anyway. But they had this Zoom call. And, you know, they didn't kind of, they left it ambiguous what this Zoom call would be. I thought it'd be like an interview. And, you know, I kind of showed up to it quite casually because I was already not that particularly that keen on, on this particular <clears throat> going into that kind of world where it's kind of very dog eat dog. And it was a Zoom call with like a hundred other teachers. Like they just had them all there. And they obviously hadn't told anyone. People, some people had notepads and stuff like that. And one of the first things they said, the host was like, look, nobody knows who you are as a teacher. Nobody knows if you've been teaching for 20 years. Nobody knows what qualifications you've got. So, you know, you can't sort of come in here and expect to be, you know, to kind of have that. You have to kind of come in. And, and he was, you know, he was saying like, the people who come onto our platform and are successful, like, you know, they'll start off at the ground level and it'll be hard work for a couple of months. You know, they build up the reputation and then they kind of move up from there. So it's kind of like this whole thing of starting from scratch, you know, and as soon as he said that, I was just like, no, thanks. Like, I'm, not, I'm not going there again you know uh, and very luckily i found this um this other um company who, who kind of already had an established clientele and the selective mm -hmm. about the teachers they hire and stuff and that that worked for me uh, but you know i'm quite thankful that i didn't have to get involved in all that and i can imagine for a lot of people it must be a nightmare you know um yeah. if, really if that's devaluing where you had to go. as well you know for yeah just really devaluing and, and kind of yeah just the sense as professionals you know and I don't use that word lightly because I think when you are in it and you've been in it it doesn't matter what kind of I mean, we can talk about qualifications but I think professionalism is a, is a state of mind you know that mm -hmm. we have about our about our jobs and Neil yeah. you were saying about like you know you want to do a good job it's just like yeah yeah it's 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 massively problematic to mm. again the future of our industry not you know at the moment I think it's all a bit like the self-organizing system but it's like i don't i'm a bit worried about how the self-organization is going to work out in the future and where it's mm. going to lead to or leave people and that's real a real concern i mean in, in in a way you could you could take it as far as just education in general it's quite yeah. It's quite difficult difficult to kind of objectively say mm -hmm. what's a good teacher what's a bad teacher yeah and how do you measure that yeah but i think like for us in 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 if i bring it back to this whole thing of what what we see as as the whole point of helping teachers online. It's like, you know, you can be a teacher on those platforms and you can do your 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 whatever, rock up, rock out, you know, as we used to have. I, I remember teachers who used to do the same in the face-to-face -face, um, context. You know, they were clock in, they rocked up two minutes before their lesson, they were out the door as soon as like the, the you know, imaginary bell rang or whatever. Um, you can be that um, if you want to. Um, but that's that's what you're going to get, you know what I mean? Or you can be like um, a more, I suppose, informed teacher, like in the online mode, I mean, like you can be, um, you can learn about things like course design, you know, you can learn how to set up your own platform. Um, and when I say platform, I don't mean, you know, like something fancy, I just mean something using a, a free and um, general access tool that you can build a course, you can um, have your own learners, you can teach groups, you can teach individuals. Um, and you can do this if this is what you want to do. And I think that's really important for teachers to know. Like, that's not the only option. You don't have to go down that, mm -hmm. that um, the, the, the Uber or the Uberfication of, of TEFL route, mm. as I've heard it's called. I think it's that's important. It's a good term for it, yeah. Yeah, I was, I'm in a, a community and that was kind of floated as a topic this week. And I think it it kind of worries people. It worries people on loads of levels. But there's so many things we think we can do in our profession to help ourselves and not future-proof completely, but certainly mm. um, support ourselves as professionals yeah. <laughs> um, in the industry. How, how would you suggest someone to go about setting up uh, th that? Because I think that's kind of the stumbling point for people is um it's how where do you where do you even begin uh-huh well i think so 
if you take like a teacher who has some experience, because again, I do think, you know, the reason that CELTA exists, for example, is to help teachers who don't have any qualifications or experience to become mm -hmm. certified and to understand things. But let's say a teacher does have a bit of something, yeah. So they've done their CELTA and they've worked in maybe one of these platforms, or maybe they've worked in the on in sorry in the face to face mode. Maybe mm -hmm. they're pre, but they're like, I want to do this. I want to set stuff up. I think there's two things that they need. One of them is they need to have a clear idea of what they want to do. So like. Do they want to teach groups? Yeah. And if they want to teach groups, great. Do they know how to teach groups? Yeah. So they need to, to kind of understand that. Yeah. It's not like you can't just sort of send out into the universe. Can I get some students? And I think, um, so, so I don't think that works. But even more specifically than like, what do I want to do with that strand of, it's something that I was reading recently as well about is the future of English teaching is, is not really general English. The future of English teaching is niche teaching because yeah. niche teaching is about um, it's about all the things that are important about teaching. It's about having clear goals for learners, having learners having clear goals, mm -hmm. you know, resources being tailored and motivation being higher. All these things are mm. super important. Um, yeah. And niche teaching is all about that. So what yeah. I, when I say who you want to teach, if you're, you know, CELTA qualified, a couple of um, maybe years experience or even not that much, who do you want to teach? Do you want to teach doctors? Um, because you've got a background in medicine in some way, maybe you've done like some medical training yourself. Do you want to teach business? Do you want to help people um, who are in, you know, sort of, I don't know, setting up their own business and want to work in English? Do you want to work with those people? Do you want to work mm. with engineers? Have you got an engineering background? So the first thing, I'm being really specific now, but that's kind of where mm. it's at, you yeah. know, who do you want to teach? Um, and maybe you, you make a list of like a load of people that you could teach. Like, for example, I couldn't really teach <laughs> medical English at the moment. So that's not going to be on my list. Yeah, but I mm. could definitely teach exams. I know exams. I could teach um, uh, kids. So I'd make my list of things that I want to teach. And then for each of those things, you have to look at where you're going to find those learners. And like, there are places you'll find those learners. Yeah. So if you want to work with, uh, if you're an, maybe got a background in engineering or something like this, you, you can go and you can approach universities, you can approach in um, on LinkedIn, you can approach organizations. Mm. You know, there's, you got to have like a plan, you know, you got to be yeah. a bit, mm -hmm. bit businessy about it. I know I'm getting pretty tech, like pretty detailed, but that's, that's how you get students. You don't get yeah. students by kind of just like saying, I want to yeah, have some students. You often I have teach. this yeah. idea yeah. that you just put up something in, whatever country mm -hmm. classified that you're aiming for mm -hmm. and you know they're gonna come to you you build the field and they will yeah, come exactly. yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work that no, way and often as well is you you are you are stuck because there's there's a there's a there's a language boundary so especially mm -hmm. with other Daughter, but <laughs> there's a language boundary with the people that you're actually trying to get hired by. You know, they mm. might, they might, they might not even be able to read your ad. And exactly. then there's barriers mm. between countries like China. Yeah. There's no Twitter. You know, you're yeah. going to have to learn how to use WeChat. How are you going to post in WeChat because it's all group mm. based? And you know, I I've got videos on that and uh, for on Team Teach China uh, on the, our YouTube about what we can, what you do with that. But um, mm -hmm. it's a it's a very nuanced, uh, and each country is yeah. nuanced, and there are definitely loads Super of boundaries. Tailored, yeah. So I think yeah, that yeah. is excellent advice because if you're contacting institutions, you are most likely going to be able to have someone uh, at least with a higher level of English that can kind of consider this yeah. offer, and especially if you you know sell it well. And uh, I think now yeah. that is going to be an important skill of being a teacher is being yeah. a business owner which means exactly. being able to sell being able to yeah. uh do all that administration and there's so much brilliant brilliant free stuff out there like just amazing stuff that you can sign up for to help you in that like strategizing you know like social media presence how to you know all these things that i've learned like things called lead magnets i didn't know what a lead magnet was you know um, 12 months ago now I know what a lead magnet is but you know what I mean it's like as if you want to do this and you want to be a teacher and you want to have your your control you have to learn some stuff mm. you know um, and, and you have to have your little plan like you have to have your website whether it's whatever it is or your presence and all those things um, it's, a, it's a bit like your 
you know, your CV used to be, but mm. CVs are, are not what you need in, in the online mode. Um, yeah. But we, we work, I, I won't work with, we have a teacher on our, on our dip at the moment and, and she's set up her own school in the States, you know, um, she's doing great. She's doing better than she needs to be doing, you know, I mean, it's possible. These things are possible, but they yeah. take, they take a bit of, a bit of, a bit of time, a bit of thought, yeah. I think, a bit of um, creativity it's- as well. It's funny because um, we, we, we were speaking to Nicola Meldrum the other day. Uh, I don't know if you saw that one up recently. And, um, you know, this actually came up and she said, you know, maybe we, maybe we need to start incorporating this on our teacher training courses. Some idea of the actual practicalities mm-hmm. of, uh, of teaching these days because, you know, so many teachers were unprepared for it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like hitting a brick wall kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and yeah. you know, there is, there are elements of that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I definitely, and this idea of niche teaching as well. And, and I think as, as well, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to think that it's not just about niches in terms of who your students might be in an English language classroom, but also what makes your English language classroom unique, because, yeah. you know, there is an element of English language teaching where people you know, one motivating factor is they're coming to learn English, but there are other motivating factors. You know, they're coming maybe for the experience. I mean, not everybody does yoga class it just solely because they want to learn yoga. There's mm-hmm. also, well, they socialize with the other students. and Maybe mm-hmm. the yoga teacher occasionally uh, says a funny anecdote and they like that experience. And they like to get involved in the culture spirituality elements to it. India yeah. Or, well, yeah, the meditation. You know, right, health so there's, there's, and fitness. It's, multi- and it's a community. It's, it's the yeah. idea is it's multifaceted, and I think definitely. language teaching is definitely set up to be something like that as well, you know, which is why I think we're, me and Neil are so interested in these people that do things a bit differently, um, because, you know, that is obviously, an, it's, 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 that's a magnet for the, for, the, for the customers that those people have, you know. Mm-hmm. Why would somebody want to have uh, Jamie Keddy-style lessons or John Kay-style lessons? Yeah. Well, you know, this idea of the poetry for John and mm-hmm. all that, and then... Uh, you know, Jamie yes, does his storytelling, exactly. he even teaches storytelling now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Like, um, that that's I was reading about something as well recently about, yeah, learners just how, yeah, the, the niche doesn't have to be the 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 English. Like, I was using examples like engineers and stuff just because I think people can kind of relate to that. But the niche yeah. could be, like you say. But it could be you want to learn English through storytelling, yeah? Right. You want to learn it. Another one that's really nice at the moment is like this international communication thing that's happening mm-hmm. and this real revolution in our industry and awareness of like English as a as an international language and English as yeah. a lingua franca and how important that is for our learners. Mm-hmm. So these, these classes which are like, do you want to learn English with someone from a totally different um, yeah. uh, language background to you? who might be similar in terms of like maybe business profile or maybe like, um, mm. you know, maybe you want to like yeah. three, three people who are like from different walks of life, but they have a similar, maybe they're all business owners, but like, I mean, they're not learning yeah. English for their business. They're learning it just to progress. But, you know, you've got yeah. a Japanese um, learner, you've got a, maybe a, a Spanish learner and a Brazilian learner. Yeah. And they're getting together and they're, and the class is, is about international communication. So that could That's be the right. niche. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Or it could be, yeah. um, like in our case, what we do is we focus a lot at the moment. We, we find out what the learners, sort of we have an idea of what the teachers want, kind of classes the teachers want to teach on the course. And then we find learners who want to take those kind of classes. Does that make sense? So mm-hmm. we, we, our current group of teachers wants okay. to do t- task-based learning. They were already uh-huh. interested in it. And task-based learning is um, uh, not mainstream, I would say, in most sort of mm. context it's used it's um definitely yeah. uh teachers are encouraged but it's not like a mainstream uh, framework for English for, language for our teaching. viewers could you kind of give like your definition or overview of what you yeah. would consider to be task-based learning yeah and they will <laughs> i mean this is the thing it's not even one thing but it is the idea of sort of fronting and putting primary the the communicative bit you know the way a lot of teachers might do a kind of speaking activity at the end of their lessons perhaps after having presented some some grammar 
or a language. Task-based learning sort of says, put that at the front, let them do it, see how they do in it, um, and then help them with what they can't do. Mm. And then get them to do it yeah. again, maybe, if you're following some people's model of task-based learning. I mean, right. I'm simplifying massively. That's sort of how, how we certainly use it. Uh, but it's the idea of like, almost like PPP flipped, you might call it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like... Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Yeah. yeah I, would you agree I, I really, with that? One, I mean, of things I really, yeah. one of the things I really like about it is how the students... It's encouraging the students themselves to notice the gap. Mm. And that is really... It kind of goes into this idea of... Um, you know, the, the interlanguage and the natural progression of a student's language, rather mm-hmm. than you saying prescriptively, okay, now you're going to learn mm-hmm. the third conditional. Um, instead, it's kind of like, no, have a chat about something. Oh, you found it a bit difficult to talk about that. Well, now let's analyze like someone who's, you know, mm-hmm. a bit more, bit more sophisticated with their language talking about it. Oh, look at that, look at that. And they kind of notice these useful little language bits, take yeah. it for themselves. And it's got that element of uh, potential for like uh, autonomous learning, hasn't it? Because yeah, that's a skill that they could then apply when yeah. they go out in the real world. Definitely. I think it has loads of potentials or like affordances, you might call it, but it, it's not without its pitfalls. And it's certainly not like something that I would say that everybody can implement in their classes. Um, but it, it's something that is often encouraged. Yeah. So people say, try a bit of TBL for lots of reasons. So what we wanted to do with our, for example, our DIP candidates is we wanted to show them, well, what would like a whole course look like of a TBL where it's like 12 lessons, TBL. Um, and how would you build the syllabus? How would you how would you do assessment? How are you going to help the learners notice their progression? You know, these things that are really motivating for learners is not just what happens in the class. You know, it's the between the classes. We all know this. But with TBL, sometimes we just do it in a pocket. And then it's like, but, but I can't really do it all the time because, like, I mean, how would they know what they've learned? You know, it's all random and all this kind of stuff. So, so yeah, we, we, we did the, we're, we're in the middle, well, we're towards the end of our 12-week course of TBL. Um, and here it goes back to that niche thing. Sorry, that's my whole point here, mm-hmm. Rich, was that, you know, maybe what we did was we advertised for learners who wanted to take a super conversation driven um, class. So we knew that people who were signing up to this class, they're not going to be going like, oh, well, where's my grammar lesson or mm-hmm. where's my and we kind of made it clear. So I think that's the other way that niche can go for teachers. It's like yeah. if you know what you're good at and you can do something really well. Like, and, and this goes as well. Maybe you're really good at like structure. Maybe you can teach like a really nice little structure course, you know, a grammar. Mm. I'm not saying, you know, throw PPP out the door. I think mm. it has its place in the world. I, and I especially in contexts I've I've worked in, you know, big, large classes, um, lots of lots of situations. PPP is exactly what the learners need. And maybe yeah, they need they like... what they want as well sometimes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but well, the point I think is, it's, it's different levels as well. I think one of the things that I always um, had issues with, with the TBL is I teach, you know, I teach really uh, young kids or I did in, in China and um, they zero English, zero English. Do you know, like, uh, where are you from? I'm fine. Thank you. Kind of English. (laughs) So task-based learning, I was like, well, how do you even do that with, you know that level because you're front loading mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. and then and then how how would you even do that as a course uh, as yeah. long sketches because you know whenever whenever i've touched upon it it's always been oh we've got a special class today yeah so, yeah, yeah. Uh, i'd yeah. be interested to hear from you uh, on on two points task-based learning when tackling students with just really low levels of mm-hmm. English, beginners like even zero English, yeah. if that's even possible, uh, or uh, as well as you know this. What's what 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 are some ideas if you could share with your approach to a curriculum of task-based learning? Yeah. So, I should I start with the low le- learners? Thing? Yes. Because I've I taught I have some experience doing this. So I'll speak a little bit from experience and then I'll speak a little bit from teachers I've worked with. So first okay. of all, I went to work in um Saudi just for a short stint in um in Saudi doing some teacher training. And um I was doing some CELTA, but what I found was I started watching the CELTA classes and um, the CELTA teachers teaching, and I was this is, goes back to this thing I was saying about, you know, putting yourselves in teachers' shoes. And I found myself watching it going, 
oh my God, I've never taught this kind of context. They're beginners. There's a class of 40 to 60 learners. Like, how can I give feedback to these teachers? How can I, how can I help them like develop? I have no idea what's going on here. So um, I had the luxury of getting a class. Um, they gave me a class to teach. Um, basically, they gave someone a break in their timetable. And I was able to go in and I taught in the mornings mm-hmm. um, for a couple of days. And just the insight it gave me was just phenomenal. The the beginners thing, you know, so beginners, 40 to 60 learners in the group. Um, And I was, yeah, like unsure how much I could get out of them. But I felt like I wanted to do the task-based thing. I wanted to do it because I felt like if I couldn't do it, then I could at least say to myself, okay, look, it's not possible. So I went in and um, and we, we tended, what we took was like a really, I suppose, very minimal very minimal input, but still input. Mm -hmm. So the thing that people think about task-based is like when you do the first task, it has to be an output task. It has to be a speaking task. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the example that I gave, wasn't it, before. But actually the first task that you do could be an input task. It could be read. It could be watch Mm -hmm. or it could be listen. So what we started to do was loads of kind of like live listening, mini little live listening. You know what I mean by live listening? So that's where like the teacher would read something. So maybe I'd start, I started a lesson by saying, you know, so my name's Emma. I'm from Dublin, but I live in London and um, I arrived in Saudi Arabia. uh, Like at that stage, I think it was like six days ago. Um, I'm staying in a hotel and the learners would listen and they had to do like a bit of processing on that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of the level when I say beginners, I mean, I guess even that was probably more like the A2 group, but, mm-hmm. you know, really sim- simple, simple, simple stuff we're talking about, you know, like, for mm-hmm. example, then the, the learners would do something with that text. Um, usually it involves some kind of dictation, working towards a dictation, something mm-hmm. like that. OK. Um, where we focused in on language. Yeah. So you start with the text, for example, listen to this um, text about me. I'll read it. And then after they listen, they have to maybe answer a question. Mm -hmm. For example, the question might be something like, do you have any questions for me? Mm -hmm. So listen to my text. And then do you have any questions for me? Now, the questions came in Arabic. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the questions, but I could work with the learners to, 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 to figure out what they wanted to know. They wanted to know which hotel I was staying in. They wanted to know, um, was the food good? They wanted to know, you know, the things they wanted to know. Yeah. So then we have our text and we might read it again. And then this time the learners are dictating. So they have to write down exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly we've worked maybe like 40 minutes in the lesson and they've got a text, which is my name is uh, I'm from, but I live in. Uh, uh, I arrived, blah, blah, blah. And uh, something else. So there's quite a lot of grammar in there. And you mm-hmm. might think, yeah. oh, that's like lots, lots and lots of grammar. But but the learners are understanding because it's really clear from the context what's going on. Um, And then we look at that grammar, but we maybe look at the bit that they're like struggling the most with. And the difference between me walking into that class and teaching them a bit of grammar and them doing this is that I get to see which grammar they need help with rather than me walking in and deciding that's the grammar that they need help with. Does that make sense? It's almost a a, a dogma task-based learning. Yeah, because uh, sort of. you know it is kind of you. You've got you've got this. You're going in there with it, and yeah. it it reveals itself as the lesson progresses, and you yeah. pivot to what's needed. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then by the end of the lesson, what you have is you have the learners producing really short texts, maybe two sentences. Um, they stuck them around the walls of the room, and they had to walk around, read them, and guess who wrote the text. Yeah, so from uh, their classmates. Um, who wrote it? They were they didn't use that. My name is they wrote my name is X, and then they wrote a little bit about themselves. And there you have like learners being able to do what they can do. Because I think the other big issue in a big class for me as a teacher is differentiation. And how do I make sure that the weakest learner is supported? But also, how do I make sure that the stronger learner is getting something from this class? Um, and I find that a real challenge as a teacher in large classes. So that would be kind of an example of a pretty low level probably like sort of just starting elementary stuff. And I wouldn't be interested if they, I wouldn't, I wouldn't care if they didn't, couldn't do all the grammar in the text. Yeah. Um, my, my, my interest is in helping them do something, you no? Know? Like, so everybody gets a little bit out of, out of that class. Obviously I've massively simplified, but that might be some, a kind mm-hmm. of shape of a TBL um, low, no, that, low, that's, low level. That's excellent. And, and how would you, 
how would you deal with the differentiation w within that? Because obviously, I, I always find if a group's really low, then there's going to be low, 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 and then there's going to be low, or yeah. just kind of low. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spectrum yeah. of lows. I think in something, yeah, in something like that, a classic um, thing that I use in, in lessons is just a bit of self-diagnosis or self-assessment. I think mm -hmm. learners can tell you very easily where they are on that scale. So after I read it the first time, I would ask something like from zero to 10, how much did you understand? Like zero is like I understood nothing. <laughs> and 10 is I'm like, I'm absolutely perfectly happy with that. And then from that number that they give you, you know where they're at. And you might put all the people with like eights, nines or tens, you might move them around the class mm -hmm. so that they can become the kind of support if you wanted to do a kind of mixed differentiation thing. If you wanted all the strong learners to work together, you might put them all together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And all the weak learners, et cetera. But I think um, we sometimes forget that learners can tell us quite a lot about where they're at um, with their own learning, you know, like, and they can- Yeah, they, there's, um, I think one of the issues with dealing with low level learners, especially for new teachers, you kind of feel like you need you need to teach because you don't have so much confidence. So you're kind of always trying to fill the void in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really difficult to be uh, a teacher and just kind of do as, do as you do and just walk into the room and with the confidence that this will all go well. You know, when, when, when there's when there's like zero, there's zero English around. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's I, I totally agree with you because it gives kind of agency to the learners as they're kind yeah. of they're almost guiding you to yeah. what they need. And then you go and then you go, oh, well, I, OK, so this is this is where, where you're at and this is how mm -hmm. I'm going to respond. So it is it is more communicative learning in a way because you're not just yeah. communicating language you're communicating learning needs one thing i'm just going to segue a little bit because i it came to mind and i wanted to bring it up before going into task-based learning in the curriculum is um so what we have and i think we touched upon this with john k and nicola is in the spectrum of teachers we seem to have the most experienced teachers working at the uh, most esteemed places, the, the places that are most difficult for learners to access uh, and the learners that can access it often mm. aren't the, the it's lowest. The, it's the high end. The high are, end are the, yeah, or, or, or already mm. pretty good with their English or at least have some level, whereas the, the lowest end uh, of the learners that don't have generally great English, I'm kind of thinking of China here, mm -hmm. um, don't have the means and uh, you know the money to to pay for you know much in the way of teaching so often what they get is especially like in rural china and why companies like vip kids magic ears all these got so big was it was so much cheaper to get a teacher through their platform than to have a teacher fly in and you know mm -hmm. etc so you end up with maybe less experienced uh, teachers, which is kind of, and I, it came to mind because of your example you just given that you've got these low level teacher, low level learners uh, mm -hmm. of English with a very experienced teacher and how well that worked together. Yet mm. we don't, we, it, it's not paired that way in mm. often in often real life in the dynamics of the yeah. market uh, i was just wondering if you could co sort of speak on that uh, yeah i think that um good a good platform i mean this is sort of a bit of advice i suppose for teachers more than anything it's like how much support do teachers get whatever platform it is? And I don't think they're all equal in terms of how, you know, we've kind of been classing them. And I think I know, I mean, obviously, Rich, you work yeah. for one that's much better, but and this is the danger. It's We don't want to like kind of paint everyone with the same brush, but it's like one question that I would encourage when I work, especially with like CELTA candidates and things to question is like, how much support will they give you mm. to teach what you have to teach? I don't mean just materials, mm. you know, um, because your CELTA course will only get you so far in teaching. <laughs> um, 
Mm. anything except your CELTA teaching practice group, right? And everybody knows that once you leave your CELTA course, you're not going to be teaching 12 lovely learners from a mix of lovely nationalities or from, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're in one country, like 12 lovely Spanish students who are motivated to come every day, you're not going to be doing that. What? unless That doesn't exist. You happen, you happen <laughs> and you, as you happen to walk into that like kind of role, but it's highly unlikely, you know, yeah. given the number of people doing CELTA courses. So my point is, sorry, I mean, I would I would hope that teachers are a little bit discerning, maybe, mm -hmm. and and I would encourage my teachers to be a bit discerning and to feel like a bit like they have the the right to ask these questions. You know, like are you going to help me to to teach that context, that group? Um, because yeah, like it's it's not just or it shouldn't just be rock up, read out the book. And if it is rock up, read out the book, or rock up, read out the the PowerPoint. And that's it. That's all that they want you to do. And that's not really a job that you really want to be jumping into, I think, you know. And I think some some platforms are better than others at this. You know, some will give you more support than others. And if they're not giving you anything, but the job still looks good, I think you have to spend a bit of time as a teacher like, getting yourself into that, like, context mode you know and not just thinking like my CELTA course is going to help me <laughs> do to teach this lesson um, mm. and that's not to say that you can't do it you know of course mm. you can do it we we can all learn really quickly but I think you know yeah that's how we've all learned isn't it we've all jumped into the situation and gone oh I'll just do my blah blah mm. blah lesson and then it's like or whatever but um, <laughs> as opposed to answer the question is like yeah first of all maybe try to be a bit discerning if you can and look for support mm. from the organization if you mm. can um i would hope that they would offer something to you um, yeah. any any kind of reasonable organization should be um offering yeah. you a little bit of a little bit of support um <laughs> and if they don't maybe like try to find it there's, there's so many amazing resources out there now like yeah. i can't get over the explosion in resources that have happened you know if you join something like linkedin and and search for what like for example teaching large classes or whatever you're going to find some really great advice about that kind of thing mm -hmm. um yeah and don't feel that you have to yeah throw babies out with bath waters you know just mm. th there's i think yeah. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question at all, Neil. Sorry, it's but, quite it's it's quite tricky sometimes to actually determine that, um, you know, up front. Um, I mean, I've I've had experiences throughout my career of both organisations that seem to present themselves mm -hmm. in that sort of way, mm -hmm. but when I got there, uh, I, you know, the the experience was not entirely positive, and then I've also had the experience of, in fact, probably the. The, the best place that I ever worked as a teacher in terms of development. I didn't really have an idea that that's what it was going to be like beforehand. Um, I kind of, you know, they, they presented a bit of that. But when I actually started working there as a summer school, I worked there four years in a row. And it was just amazing. I don't know what it was about the environment there, mm. but they were really focused on development. And everyone seemed kind of excited about it as well. It was like, you know, the kind of this excitement that you sometimes get on teacher training courses, I think. This kind of excitement of trying something new and doing something new. And it was there. Um, and I think that, for me, is like, that's uh, it's like the X factor of an institution, you know, if you can mm -hmm. work somewhere where there's almost this kind of excitement about yeah. teaching and, and doing stuff. You know, people people chat about their lessons and kind of have a good time. You know, it's like the, it's the opposite to that thing where someone mentions lessons and then someone else at the table says, don't talk shop <laughs> outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's the opposite to that. People actually want to talk about the things they've been doing in class. And I, mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. I yeah. actually think it's it. Uh, I totally agree with you there, Emma. It it really is about for for teachers to discern and kind of to be honest in reflection of where where they are at or what why are they doing it? Because I don't think that there is anything wrong with you know these these companies that just you know like it's online learning. They give you a PowerPoint and you just go through that and you know and that's how they keep their costs low that's how they don't have to pay teachers so much because the value isn't on the uh how experienced and how good that teacher is it, they're just kind of another tool they're just another tool to deliver the product and one mm -hmm. of the th you know i think one of the things that we 
many teachers often get caught up in is, is this romanticized idea of being uh, a teacher and um, but you know there are some people that just see it as a job and can be part of that clog and I'm if someone wants to do that, I'm happy with them them doing that just as long as they follow what the company wants to do. And mm-hmm. that's fine. And I actually think this is probably going to end up being how many become accidental Teflers going forward. They'll be doing this and be like, actually, I think I can do a little bit more apps out of that. And that's yeah, where yeah, I yeah. hope, you know, uh, our channel and Dublin Teffel will step in and go... Okay, so what what can I do that's a little bit different? Mm-hmm. How can yeah. I establish my own brand and how can I diverge from there? So I I really do think that all these words worlds aren't so different. It's just you kind of have to be honest with yourself as to why you're doing it, but also mm-hmm. really discern with businesses as well because they are businesses. So mm-hmm. you will get International House, you will get... Uh, Oxford University and you all get magic ears all saying we are a teaching education company there's degrees and Mm -hmm. don't just listen Mm -hmm. to the sales but be very discerning with that yeah I think it's like that blinkers thing it's like don't and and also you know just know what you're getting yourself into as well you know Mm. don't like said you know this is what they want you to do and, and, and you you will do it and if you don't want to do it don't don't do it then you know I mean like it's it's that you know it's like yeah um and and as yeah like I think these these platforms are like the new the new hog one no they're the new um, yeah oh and and so a year later it's like actually I could do a pretty good job on this I reckon you know if I had a bit more time and I yeah yeah it's fun because I mean you know it's it's not that difficult to have a conversation with someone uh, and mm-hmm. especially if you're dealing with kids, it's just fun. It's just fun to talk mm-hmm. with kids uh, in general. And then you go, well, actually, you know, I maybe if I can have a good conversation with them, but also I can do a little bit, maybe I can guide it a little bit and maybe mm-hmm. they learn a little something. And then you mm-hmm. start to get that itch and you, mm-hmm. you end up doing podcasts like this. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'd like to go kind of back to Mm -hmm. the tbl and you talked about developing a course i I think that that's going to be really interesting uh not just for myself but you know for our viewers and for our our listeners as well because you know i know a lot of people that want to get into that but you know how do they how do they even do that especially i get a lot of people that are english teachers that are non-native as well so Mm -hmm. how do you how do you how would you do how you develop that and put that together i think would be Mm -hmm. really interesting for them i think there's like two big pieces of advice that i'd give Mm -hmm. um one is for course course setting up the course how you set up the course um so a good a good task is a task is only as good as how interested the learners are going to be in doing the task Mm -hmm. you know um, uh, tasks are motivating if the learners want to do them. I mean, um, if you put me in a class and said, plan your um, fantasy football team, Emma, in Spanish, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't be very engaged in that task. Yeah, but so that's just, just an, you know, that's an example. Um, but there are a lot of people who would find that absolutely super interesting and that would be exactly what gets them engaged. Yeah, so at the early stages of course planning, Literally, when you get these learners, when you found them, however many they are, you have to find out what does motivate them. You have to find out what they want to do. And not just in that like, oh, yeah, I really want to improve my English. Brilliant. Why? I want to speak to people in English. Brilliant. OK, that's not going to help you. <laughs> that's not going to help you design a task based course because you don't know who they want to speak to. You don't know what they want to talk about. You don't know where they're going to be with their English or where they see themselves being. So the, my top tip here is use some kind of needs analysis device like maybe mm. a future you visualization, something like that. So mm. the idea here would be get the mm. learners to imagine themselves in a year's time. Maybe you can do it. I often do it in the class, like as in, in class, everyone closes their eyes, turns off their camera, um, spend a few minutes talking them through the visualization. It's a year's time. You're speaking English. Who are you speaking to? Um what are you talking about? You're reading a bit of English. What are you reading? Why are you reading it? What are you going to do with that information? Mm. Um, so this is something that is super, super powerful, this future self 
um, vi vision, you might call it. And we try to tap into it early in a course, like with especially with task-based learning, because what you get to extract from the answers when everybody shares their future selves, you get to find out where the overlap in what they want to do is, what they want to talk about. So, for example, on the course we're running at the moment, um, in one of the classes, because we're running two classes, one of them, the future was all about like watching movies and listening to podcasts and talking to people from other countries, mostly kind of online, really. They don't want to travel much. I suppose they can't really imagine travel. Um, but they want to kind of be part of an online community of English speakers who are like watching films, watching TV series. So we've kind of designed the course around that, you know. So the course is about being able to understand um, a bit of a, a TV program. So you're working on like listening skills and maybe a bit of vocabulary, um, things like that yeah so you're, you've built the course around the tasks mm -hmm. that lead to their future selves yeah so that's my first tip is um, make sure your needs analysis helps you extract what tasks might work if you want to do a task-based approach mm -hmm. because if you don't have good tasks it's going to fall flat on its face um, and then the second thing is keep really good records of what's going on in your lessons mm -hmm. and my top tip for keeping good records is using a lesson summary device so getting um, the teacher of the class to basically write like a half an A4 page usually, or maybe an A4 page, which summarizes what happened in the lesson and embeds into it all the like target language that comes up or mm. all the emergent language grammar um, phrases. Um, and we do it like on a Google Doc thing. So we can also include like voice notes, mm. of pronunciation support, things like that. And lesson summaries then basically become like a kind of retrospective syllabus because what you get from a lesson summary is you find out what happened. So then when you're planning assessment, you can very easily come up with assessment because assessment is, because the course is is, is written down. And one of the problems with task-based learning and any kind of very reactive approach to teaching is people find it hard to assess it because it's like, what happened? How did it happen? But by keeping kind of quite thorough lesson summaries, I'm sorry, we shared them with the learners. So the learners have access to these. They read them, they use them to study, to develop. Um, and there's always embedded tasks, you know, mm -hmm. like things we've embedded into the, into the lesson summary. So now we're on like lesson 10. So we've got 10 of these summaries and we're coming to the end of the course. There'll be a bit of um, assessment. We're going to set some Flipgrid video tasks for the learners to, to do based on, you know, things that have come up in, in the course so far, there'll be some Quizlet, um, we're going to do some Quizlet vocabulary, um, uh, what do you call them, exams, I want to call them exams, quizzes, <laughs> they're called quizzes, yeah. uh, some quizzes which will review all the vocabulary, so we'll be able to assess kind of vocabulary retention that way, um, but these lesson summaries, they're just like really simple, you know, narratives of what happened, um, they take no time to, pre to well, I say prepare, you do them after the lesson, um, they take no time at all, but they become a really, really good record of learning of what happened. And they're a good way for teacher development as well, because if your summary is kind of short and there's not much language in it, you're like, oh, I didn't really teach much today, did I? Hmm. So they're quite a good, they're a good tool for the teachers to kind of be reflecting on their own practice. Um, and that's something that I did steal from Kerry Jones, um, because I am a master thief. <laughs> so um, yes, thank you, Kerry, for those lesson summary ideas. She taught a, a dogma course many years ago to a group of um, um, what do you call them? Like older learners? What do you call mm. them? Um, yeah, seniors. Senior. Seniors. <laughs> Although, yeah, I'm not sure about that word, but uh, yeah, the, she she taught a group of older learners in Spain with total dogma, like no no plan at all, and she used them to to record the syllabus as it emerged. Um, and I think any teacher who wants to work reactively, it's just a really simple technique you can Im implement with your learners. Really powerful, I, I, in our experience and in my experience as well. No, I, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice, and uh, I agree with that, especially with the reactive. It's, it's one of those ones where it, with no course book and no i mean there is a plan but with no course book or curriculum it can kind of that's often the problem that you get especially you know when you've got young learners and their parents well, they want to know what's happened so by keeping that summary you know it it helps them understand that there is progression and and what mm -hmm. happened and mm -hmm. you know it's better than just 
circling you know sentences that they've done and uh, and mm-hmm. all that sort of jazz but it's very interesting mm-hmm. and what you brought up about uh, on your first point is uh it's very i mean the the visualization that's NLP that's that was like the John K stuff that we were, we've talked about previously it's very interesting how that converges but it makes a lot of sense because it's linguistic but um the idea of getting them to tell you what it is that they like and then fulfilling that is kind of like a very business uh uh business concept in the uh, mm-hmm. the Mm-hmm. You you go you approach a business. Oh, what is your need? And then you create a solution for that need. So mm-hmm. there's a there's a whole lot of stuff in there where you can kind of see if you're a teacher watching that you want to be having a, a mindset of well, what 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 skills do you have? What mm-hmm. you know? How does that relate to some learners that you're targeting? Mm-hmm. Talk to those learners find out what it is that interests them, what it is that they want. You know, visual visualization is that great technique and then give it to them. It doesn't have to be more difficult than that. Mm-hmm. You're just fulfilling mm-hmm. the need and that's mm-hmm. that's the market. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yeah, finding that engage, that level of engagement is definitely critical, isn't it? Yeah. So what what can you do to engage engage learners um, and people of their different things? That's what all, that's where all these different styles come from, really, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, personally, the thing that I've been doing quite a lot of recently is this kind of like pseudo clill. I don't want to call it actual clill, uh, but it's sort of pseudo clill, like le- a lesson where you kind of learn about something new. Um, it tends to be kind of based on something I've been doing myself. Uh, because I don't know about you, Emma, but during the lockdown, I basically took up like a million and one new hobbies <laughs> and started doing all this stuff. So I was like making my own homemade wine and I've like made my own sauerkraut and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and these things something can like a be bit surprising. Of <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And these things can be surprising. They can make like fantastic material yeah. for. Uh, for English classes, so um, I've, I've really, I've really got into that and this kind of like sciencey, history-based uh, stuff. I, I really like doing that. Very stuff. on trend as well. This, this, this clearly, as you call it, like clill adjacent. You know, like I think yeah, clill, right. clill has a bad name sometimes, but I think as well, yeah. like clill with. I don't know whether you're working with like adults or not, but clill with adults is just like a massive area that hasn't really been explored. I think properly. Yeah, and yeah I work with adults. Really, maybe, really, yeah. really I, motivating. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think they really appreciate it because they come away from it and go, ah, oh, there's something new. And it wasn't necessarily just the English, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I know as my, as if I reflect on my own Spanish learning, like the stuff that I learned, yeah, like, I mean, I remember going to a wine tasting once um, in, actually it was in Catalan. It was kind of mixed Spanish and Catalan. I didn't speak Catalan, but it was, Spanish was used as a supporting language. Um, but the amount I learned was just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. like I learned... Just an, I, I, it was a two-hour, you know, it wasn't a language lesson, by the way. It was I learned about wine, um, yeah, right. but you walk away with all this language. And I think, um, from a motivation point of view, it's an area that we, I think, has has got real potential for for tapping in because, people, yeah, as humans, we love learning, we love it, yeah. And the language can get a bit heavy, it can get a bit demotivating because language is yeah. a bit hard, you know. Yeah, language learning is hard. It's really yeah. tough um, for yeah. most people. But yeah, learning yeah, I mean, about stuff is kind of cool. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's... You can kind of yeah, piggyback cool. on there, uh, in a way. And yeah. yeah, I think that's kind of where our industry uh, can step in because maybe, maybe you aren't the, you know, uh, the number one person or even in the anywhere remotely top echelon of you know being a, a best social media guy or something like that but you are an experienced english teacher and you offer a course to teach social media via english or something like yeah. that then you're mirroring both of those skills there's um that's actually a, mm. a big uh, tim ferris thing he talks about mm. that the thing moving forward is 
uh, converging skills together. So mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. not just not just having one skill set, but being able to combine them and cross them over. So mm-hmm. uh, that's what you're kind of seeing with all these uh, academics right now. Uh, where you see someone like Sam mm. Harris, for example, neuroscientist, philosopher, but also a great speaker. Uh, those are two separate skills that have been combined to create this new thing. Mm-hmm. This, mm-hmm. I'm not so niche, but you know, being multifaceted and multi-skilled. And I think that's going to start mm. applying to our industry well, moving forward. Yeah, one of the things that, that me and you kind of want to get onto at some point, Neil, isn't it, with the podcast, is you want to start talking to people in general education, because um, you know I don't I don't know what you think about this, Emma, but I've always thought that the the pedagogy in English language teaching, especially at the kind of top level, although we have the the bad reputation of the backpacker industry, you know, once it once people have took an interest and invested in these different things, I think the the pedagogy is really kind of top notch. You know, when you get a yeah. good a good language teacher, you know, um, and you know, I don't know if I'm doing a distur- disservice to general education, but you know, my memories of uh, the way people taught was they weren't particularly using these sort of understandings of how people learn that we use today. And yeah. I very recently did a master's course in the university, and um, I don't particularly have anything good to say about the, the pedagogical techniques used in um, postgraduate courses at university. Um, so for me, I think there's a, there's a lot that, you know, if even if we are, you know, um, as you say, the, the industry language teachers don't have the, the most prestigious reputation. I think, I feel like we have something to, to to teach the, the teachers of other areas to be honest yeah. and I, i'd like to i wonder if there's a way that these two worlds can come together a little bit mm. i mean i think absolutely and i know exactly what you mean about that like feeling far ahead of the game i think maybe more recently things are not catching up but developing in the mainstream education i, I do know a little bit about this from right. from experience but but it's, it's the classic thing. I mean, working as a CELTA tutor, you get a trainee on the course who's come from mainstream education. They do a CELTA course and they're like, I've learned more in a month than I learned on my, you know, two yeah, years PGC. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's not um, a coincidence. I mean, that's said by many, many, many people and it's kind of anecdotal, but also I think it, it there's something going on there. Mm. But this idea of like, we do have a, a good understanding when, when we, when we've developed as teachers and you know the levels of teachers are obviously different but yeah we're when we understand learning when we talk about learning in language teaching we do kind of we talk about it really you know like how we learn we're interested in it people might have different approaches different methods but the conversation is happening in a way that maybe it isn't always happening in education in mainstream mm. education or not for everybody because they are much more bogged down <laughs> in paperwork point, and yeah. procedural stuff mm-hmm. and it's just really it's it, it's like quite overwhelming for those teachers but I think for mm. teachers watching maybe or people who are interested I mean personally I found that um, being on LinkedIn in the last year or so has just incredible connections between fields you might call them as Neil said right. so I you know I, I follow people from various fields and the positive impact it's had on my own professional growth is just outstanding you know I'm very interested in for example instructional design so I've learned a lot Mm. about like instructional design but instructional design isn't really you know connected isn't a TEFL thing you know yes I do design courses for teaching and courses for learning but there's a whole field of instructional design that has very sound um, kind of uh, principles and, and pedagogy if you like underneath it and I've learned a lot from that and I've learned a lot from being connected with people in mainstream education so I think for teachers this idea of diversification as Neil says like sort of multifaceted how can we develop ourselves I think joining like professional learning communities as they call them Mm -hmm. um, is so much more possible now and so rich in terms of the what you can get out of it you know Um, it's it's we live in a very kind of um, yeah just full of of things world you know things that we if we want them we can have them very quickly that and in in terms of our development that's a great thing i think oh it's absolutely fantastic and you know what i'm i feel so uh sounds cliche blessed to be where i am uh now in terms of technology and internet access to information it, it's just fantastic it's great and there's there's no limit to it the only limit is your c- curiosity and desire to learn mm-hmm. and my my only uh not f- 
not fear, but my only um, thing that I worry about is that the the mainstream uh, education, the especially public education, is is just is falling behind uh, mm -hmm. to everything that's been put out there. You know, like uh, we're talking mm -hmm. about this sort of thing. I'm not sure how much that is actually happening within you know the education system uh mm -hmm. and, and a lot of like uh you know as a parent as well i'm looking I, I use a lot of techniques that i have you know with raising you know my child and i i do that on i put that on team teacher baby or i will be more uh mm -hmm. going forward with that but you know there's uh a lot of people are just kind of working this out themselves and mm -hmm. it's outside of the education system and then, then yeah. and they are doing a very good job of you know early learning you know putting being able to condense ideas and put them on instagram for people to easily use um however there is kind of is this best practice instances to that and it's just unfortunate that the the, the mainstream education uh, or public education is not more involved with that to guide it more yeah, I think that's very country based, isn't it? Countries like, well, you know, we can only speak from the countries we personally, I can speak from the countries that I've lived in or had been in education myself, you know, or, or had someone in education, like one of my, my kids or whatever. But I do think that that's, that is a, a difference between countries, you know, how, how on it the public um, or the state or the national curriculum or whatever you want to call it is in those like shall we call them I don't know up to date or whatever you want to call it um approaches and methods is varies greatly yeah like yeah but it, leave, it leaves it leaves more room for private businesses to pursue this yeah. and people will move that I mean yeah how many kids uh how many parents are sending their kids not to just yeah. general daycare but to Montessori to Waldorf to yeah. all these yeah. different ones because they're like yeah no, this right. this is how I think it should work and you know it's yeah. often mm -hmm. supported by that and well, um, generally early childhood learning is actually pretty pretty up to date I found myself yeah in, in many respects but you know maybe Ge it's Ge going on I think Ge Ge Jeremy Harmer said this at a talk actually a couple of years ago he was talking about you know the 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 can of worms of the future of community of language teaching that Obviously, people have been talking about it at conferences for about the past twenty-five years, and um, and he was talking about it, and he was going on about the 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 change that might be required to survive the oncoming challenges. Little did he know about mm. the, the oncoming <laughs> pandemic. But, um, and he spoke he spoke about how the the institute the big institutions were like those oil tankers on the horizon, kind of grinding along moving super slow and he's and then he spoke about how you know we as individuals or small businesses or whatever that can be like little speed boats you know um as, as you've mentioned before neil we can pivot uh so there's mm. there's kind of more opportunity to explore these other ways of doing things mm -hmm. institutional change takes a long time mm -hmm. but individuals can can sort of innovate yeah I think there's a lot of like potential yeah, for sort of more bottom up, shall we call it? Yeah. Um, especially nowadays, again, with the access, with the connections, I think teachers and not just myself, but who I've talked to just feeling more connected. And, and if you're not feeling connected, then like there's possible, you know, maybe you need to reflect on why, but there's so many ways that we could, that you could, you can um, and things you can find. Yeah. Like, where your where your passion is within that bottom up process of teaching and development, mm. and I think for me that's really the future as well of teaching and teacher development is teacher driven, um, not institutionally mm. driven, and yeah. And I think that is an so absolute we... perfect segue into uh, wrapping this up and you giving mm. your final thoughts on you know, being a titan of teacher training and development, how can teachers and other learners, viewers, you know, get in touch with you and uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you so much. Sorry, Neil, for interrupting. Thank you so much, Rich, for Rich for reaching out. Oh, that's a nice, fun, fun, isn't it? Yeah. Rich, 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 Rich. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah reach, and, reach out, Rich. Yeah, there we I'm go. Doing. Oh, I've got it for next um, time. <laughs> And yeah, Neil as well. It's been a 
really enjoyable um, chat. And I think the way that I see the world right now is super, super hopeful in terms of our industry. I think I see so many possibilities for teachers um, in the things that have happened that maybe felt like really stressful at the time. You know, like a year ago, things felt like being imposed upon and all this kind of stuff. And as we step out of that thing, you know, that, remember that thing that happened? Yeah. Um, as we step out of it, I think like hopefully, and I I know it because of the people I'm working with, there's like slightly maybe like mm, light bulbs going off. And I think for teachers to just follow those light bulbs is really important because there's so many possibilities, you know, like, uh, and they can be the driver of their own development. Uh, there are things out there in the world in the internet that they can access there are learning communities facebook you know put in a group that you want to join on facebook you'll find it i've learned so much in the last like six months from from different communities that i'm involved in and yeah just like follow your spark you know that kind of way i suppose that's my big advice mm. for teachers because then then it'll then it'll be at least as good as it can be yeah and you know a career teffler <laughs> <laughs> Accidental career Teffler. Um, yeah, it's possible. And uh, can you can you let us know how we get in touch with you? Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can contact us. Um, I think info at Dublin Teffel is a good place to, to contact us by email. If you're interested in um, individual CPD or if you're interested in our DIP TESOL course, which will be starting um, the next intake is October, so it's kind of in line with the academic year in lots of countries. Uh, we'll be running a kind of nine-month online program. Um, lots of things that we've talked about today are kind of covered in there, plus a whole lot more. It's an internationally recognized qualification and equivalent to a Delta, so um, lots of rigorous study, but also so much development. Um, and I think Rich, as a, as a dipper, you'd give your thumbs up to it as a, yeah, as a step, a step in the, the career, you know, that you might want yeah. to take if that's the, if that's the kind of spark that's been mm. um, lit or whatever for you. If that's where I you think want very, to. I very much felt like the CELTA was a piece of paper that I was kind of, because I was like you, I, I went into it after I had been teaching for a few years. It was kind of a piece of paper I was getting to show to employees. Not that I didn't get anything out of it. I got, I think I learned how to write a good lesson plan um but then the, the diploma was something i just enjoyed pretty much from start to finish mm -hmm. uh, it was thoroughly enjoyable and, and really uh, opened up kind of a world a world of teaching which um previously i just thought you know oh well this is the cell to way this is how you do it and then mm -hmm. you discover all these other kind of possibilities yeah yeah and i think from the dip point of view the journey is really important but for lots of teachers, the piece of paper is also very important. So it does open so many it doors. Yes, it does. It really <laughs> does. But but luckily, or I suppose, you know, fortunately, it also, it's an incredible process to, to, to go through. Um, and we very much enjoy supporting teachers go through that in Dublin TEFL. So if you're interested, yeah, check us out at dublintefl.com or send us an email at info at Dublin TEFL. That's fantastic. Thank you for coming on to the show. It's been uh, just an absolute pleasure and uh, you know hopefully we'll see you uh, on the show again sometime mm -hmm. thanks again guys bye bye